Thank you, Lord, for the power of your gospel. Thank you, Lord, that through that power, you have gathered to yourself a people. And uh, this evening, we are one representative of that great community of believers across time as your church. And we want, as we begin this evening, to keep that vision in mind of your gospel and of your people gathered around that gospel. Uh, We pray, Lord, that uh, this evening would be something that encourages everyone, and we pray, Lord, that there'll be nothing said in this slightly less formal environment of questions and answers. There'll be nothing that is said that would be a stumbling block unnecessarily to anyone. We pray, Lord, that uh, your name would be honored, and we don't ask that lightly as your people here in Wheaton at College Church. It is our desire above all, not that you would make us look good or make our programs look good or make our efforts look good, but most of all, Lord, and above all, we want you to be honored. We want you to be lifted up. We pray that so passionately We desire it for our church, for your church. We desire it for the families in this church, for the individuals. At every stage of life, from the cradle to the grave, may we be a church that so rejoices in you that people look and say, their God must be great. So we ask, Lord, for a new work of your spirit among us to that end. Help us to love you and to love your word. And as we do that, Lord, to love each other, to give way to each other when we are passionate about something that perhaps someone else has a different preference, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so as a people gathered around your word to increasingly be a treasured possession, setting forth the word of life, holding it out and holding on to it with pure doctrine and pure life, all to the honor of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do please come in as we just began with prayer and find a seat, and we're glad that you're here uh, this evening. And we won't suggest that the rest of us got here before you. So welcome, friends. Come on in. And uh, as uh, last time, I will just uh, set some of the ground rules, if you like. Uh, This is not our typical evening service. Uh, The pastors uh, felt that it would be good after the series we're doing at the moment on Sunday morning on cross and culture to, as it were, give some extra time for any questions that people might have, to be able to ask them and for us to look at the Bible together in that format. And so that's the purpose this evening. If you're a regular evening service person and you come in and you wonder where the music is and all the rest, uh, this evening, in the next few moments, we're just going to give ourselves to focusing on this theme of cross and culture from the morning service, and in particular this morning the theme of sexuality. Uh, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 20, and we traced out how the gospel is at the heart of Paul's response to all the sexuality questions that uh, the Corinthian Christians were facing in their city. And the more we look to that, the more we realize how similar they are to the questions that our culture today faces. And so Paul's answer became very pertinent and relevant to our situation. And he was encouraging them by this repeated refrain, do you not know, to remember the word of the cross that he preached to them when they became a Christian. 
And as we trace that through creation, fall, redemption, and response, we looked at how that would impact our conversations about sexuality in the culture and the wider church. Again, as I said this morning, when I use the terms culture and church, I, and culture I just mean those uh, outside the church, and how they tend to think and how they tend to act. And then by church, I don't mean in an undefined way, college church, I just mean the church in general, Christians. And we've looked through how that word of the gospel, the word of the cross, impacts that conversation. And then we looked at some practical uh, questions and application in that regard. So that's the purpose this evening, just to dig a little bit more into that which we were looking at this morning. And we're among friends, and so we can um, be relaxed and talk. Uh, the purpose, uh, though, tonight is not to give everyone here a chance to um, preach, as it were, <laughs> or to, to make statements about what they think. Uh, we, of course, do want a, a vibrant um, uh, conversation and community in the church, and we have that. We want to encourage that. But tonight, the, question, the, the point is really, as, as we've said, a question and answer. And I'm not suggesting that I, of course, have all the answers, by no means, as you will soon discover. Um, but uh, we want to give you, by means of questions, to dig into it. So let me encourage you, as you begin to think through what kind of questions you might have, to formulate them as questions. We have pastors, on the, so John is there on that aisle with a microphone, and we have someone in the middle aisle. I think, who's going to be Dan, uh, there with the mi white microphone, red, white, and green, not red, white, and blue, oh dear. Uh, and Eric there is on the left. And uh, so um, when you have a question, simply raise your hand, and then one of the pastors will come by and will offer you the microphone. But I've, we're encouraging um, the pastors to hold on to the microphone. And that's just to um, both to position the microphone in such a way that you can be heard, and that's not as easy to do as sometimes people think. Not only to do that, but also to perhaps break in if the question becomes lengthy. And uh, so that's what we're, we're, we're suggesting tonight. And then um, Without further ado, let's get on with it, and we'll see how we do. And if we finish soon, it's a nice day outside, and that's okay. Uh, but we're going to not go much longer than about 7 o'clock, as per usual. So I will do my best to make sure we have the questions in order. And uh, I'll need your help. If you feel like you've been left out, just raise up both hands, and I'll know that I'm missing someone. So we had a question right here at the front. Um, Dan, if you come down right here. That was definitely the first hand in the air. Dan's going to come for you. Okay, Josh, uh, Bruce Main. Yeah. Will you expand uh, the phrase, and the two shall become one flesh? Mm. And does it always mean the same, whether it's Genesis 2 or 1 Corinthians 6, or is there a change in meaning? Uh, oh, does it always mean the same? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, I'm trying to think why it wouldn't mean the same. Well, anyways, let me start with the, the first part of the question, which is to e expound what uh, the two shall become one flesh. So as you know, uh, Bruce, that goes uh, back to um, the beginning of the Bible and Genesis. And so uh, God there, as he has created Adam and Eve, he has this wonderful sort of lyrical poem in Genesis chapter 2 where the man is lonely and God, as it were, sort of brings him animals to see what any of them would do, you know. And a, a helper, suitable helper for the man was not found. And uh, God uh, created a woman and, um, and brought Eve uh, to Adam, and Adam says, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. It's almost like, I cannot believe this. And uh, so there's this beautiful union where the two shall become one flesh. Now, obviously, that's talking about the physical union, 
um, of, of the intimacy of sex within marriage. Um, but there are other aspects to it too. That physical union represents a union of soul, a commitment. I've always loved how Matthew Henry in his commentary talks about it. He says, um, and I'll paraphrase, I won't get it exactly right, but he says that woman was taken out of man's rib, not out of his head, nor out of his feet, out of underneath his arms, it were, close to his heart, that he might be cherished, she might be cherished by him and cared for by him. So there's this beautiful, not just physical union, but emotional uh, connectivity, soul connectivity. And of course, in the whole trajectory of Scripture, and which may come to the second point that you're talking about there, that, that marriage then takes on, as Paul looks back on it, and I always interpret the Song of Songs through this lens, Ephesians 5, as Paul looks back on um, Genesis, he says, well, actually, this is a profound mystery, marriage, but what I'm talking about is Christ and the church. So what I think that means is that marriage and the union which is within marriage is intended to be a sermon. So a mystery is a technical word, that which is, was hidden but is now revealed in Christ. So married people in their union now have the opportunity to, by they, how they interact, to preach the message of Christ's love and of the church's submission to that love. And as it were, re redeem both those concepts that are so ruined in our culture. So there is a beautiful dance of marriage that speaks of far more than merely romantic love, but actually speaks of the very nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 6, I think what so horrifies Paul is that, that do you not know that they haven't realized by some of the slogans that were around in the day that they were so trivializing this, this theology of union that I've just begun to talk about uh, that with prostitution and, 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 and if they only could realize the preciousness of sex. I mean, there are many things to say about sex. One of them is our culture talks too much about sex. You know, I remember when I was an undergraduate, um, as you know, I was, sec I was educated in a very secular environment. And I had a lot of friends there who would say, our problem is we don't talk enough about sex. And I would say to them, no, our problem is we talk far too much about sex, you know. And I think there's some truth to that. We live in a highly sexualized environment. But on the other hand, there's another aspect to it, which is part of our problem is we have too low a view of sex. In the Bible, it's, it's, it's ultimately about the wedding banquet of the, of the bride of Christ. And so actually marriage is really about that, which makes it such a glorious opportunity and because we're fallen so hard. Anyway, those are some thoughts, Bruce. There's a question at the back there. I only see one other. Hi, I'm Catherine Lyon, and I have hey, a Catherine. question uh, of how to answer someone's questions. So my husband and I had an opportunity to travel this summer in Europe, and we found ourselves sitting across a couple on a train ride for several hours uh, who proceeded to tell us a heartbreaking story of how their son is in the process of becoming a woman mm. and how that's affected their family. And uh, so we talked a lot about a lot of things. I heard terms and uh, concepts that I hadn't really heard before and uh, it was uh, really uh, confusing, overwhelming in, in all the options that there are and how people identify themselves, how they orient themselves and then their gender identified at birth. So mm -hmm. I found myself, you know, hearing, you know, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and, you know, God created, but how does that just so interfacing with all mm -hmm. these, what the world is sort of redefining as truth. So at some point, this uh, man who loves his son 
is trying to adapt to they and all these things, um, just ask, I don't know what the big deal is. What difference does it make? Mm. And so in my mind, I'm thinking through all the options, you know, does, okay, so trying to help them know that I'm not afraid or I wouldn't, I love them or I'm not homophobic as far as I know, but I um, don't want to be judgmental or harsh, but know that it does make a difference. Do I go political? Do I go spiritual? Do I mm -hmm. talk about sin? So my question is, when you talk to people, um, how do you answer that question in a very, in a, a cogent, succinct, loving way? How do you say or describe or tell how, why it matters? Yeah, what that's... difference does it make? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. That sounds like a very, uh, first of all, I commend you for having that conversation. Obviously, t whoever that was felt free to talk with you, and that's, that's a wonderful posture to have. And uh, also, thank you for bringing that important question into clarity for us. Um, so I have, I guess, a sort of initial thought and then um, a, a categorization thought, okay? So the initial thought would be, again, I, I'm just impressed by the way you characterize your conversation because I think it's easy, whether it's this or something else. And in 20 years, it will be something else, right? And 20 years ago, it was something else. And if you were living in Iran, it would be something else. But it's easy when, as a Christian, we, we meet uh, a behavior or an attitude that is, feels like it's diametrically opposed to what we believe, to either run away or to react with fear or anger or abandon the truth that we hold on to. And of course, the right thing as a Christian to do is to love the person and uh, figure out how to express the truth of what we believe to that person. And that's a difficult thing to do, but I, I'm just glad to hear of that ethos that you represented there, so thank you. Um, so that was the sort of initial thought. The categorization thought was having, and by the way, can you hear, am I being quiet enough, am I being loud enough? Yeah, okay. Um, having sort of set that initial thought in place, then in the conversation, I will want to discern what kind of person am I dealing with? Now, I don't mean that psychologically or by a personality test. I actually mean that spiritually. So my approach to a non-Christian on this issue would be not entirely different to a Christian, but significantly different. And if someone is a Christian, my approach to someone who's in a Bible teaching church like College Church, where I would assume that they had a reasonably coherent biblical worldview, will be different than if I was approaching someone who maybe is a real Christian, perhaps goes to a, a church that doesn't teach the Bible. And so there'd be subcategories there, but initially it'd be, is this person a real regenerate Christian or, or not? Um, and if they're not a regenerate Christian, that, that would be, I, I would actually start, so it's one thing to talk to the parents, it's another thing to talk to the child. So if we assume we're talking to the child first, I would start, it sounds simplistic, but I'm just going to say it and then tell you a story, okay? I would start with Jesus. Uh, I'm just convinced, biblically and experientially, that's the right place to start. Um, and uh, I'll just t tell you a story. So there's a, a woman who was um, a Yale undergraduate, and she was in a lesbian relationship, and her mother was in a lesbian relationship. Uh, she got to know some Christians. They did not talk to her about her lesbianism. That wasn't where they started. They talked to her about Jesus. And they befriended her. And before too long, she decided she wanted to find out more about Jesus. She started to come to church. She heard the Bible. She decided she wanted to read the Bible. 
She decided Jesus was an amazing person. She decided she wanted to follow Jesus. She read the Bible more. She realized Jesus called her, called her to a lifestyle that she was not following. She gave up her lesbian lifestyle. Years later, she's married. In fact, she now has a ministry on this very issue. So I do think it's important. Martin Lloyd, one of the influences for me, as you probably picked up, is a man called Martin Lloyd-Jones, a great Welsh preacher. Lloyd-Jones would sometimes say, and he, you know, he, um, he would bristle. So he was a little more prophetic than I probably am. So he, he would sometimes say, it is heresy to ask a non-Christian to behave like a Christian. So you've, you've got to first start with Jesus and, and then lead some to Jesus and then, and then when now you go over to the other category. So when we're not a Christian, it is not possible not to sin. When we become a Christian, we receive God's Spirit, now it is possible not to sin, which doesn't mean we won't sin. He who says he has no sin deceives himself and the truth is not in him. But it does mean we can be called to obedience and we must obey because we have the power to obey because we have God's spirit. We're a new creation. And then in heaven one day, mercifully, praise God, there'll be a moment, a time, an eternity when now it is not possible to sin. But in this in-between stage for the Christian, we call them to a lifestyle of obedience. And then if that's a Christian, then I walk through the creation, fall, redemption, response. It would take time. I'd look through the Bible, and then we'd lead to a lifestyle. On that particular issue, transgender, I would inevitably bring in, and this is why there is overlap between the two categories. At some point, I'd bring in just some of the raw data which I did a lot of research on over the summer. So the, the amount of people who are intersex or hermaphrodite, a real condition, different kinds of it, that is born with both gender body parts, is actually very small. It doesn't sound like it's very small. If you read this literature right now, it sounds like it's quite a lot of people, but it's actually 0.018%, which doesn't mean it's no one. These are real people but it does mean it's really small. The transgender issue, what I'm feeling, I'm feeling like I'm a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa. This is a, there are people who truly struggle with this. We, we must, this is real people. We, we, we must love these people. Um, but data helps. So uh, Paul McHugh, who I don't know what his faith is, um, has, uh, just in terms of the data, um, you know, distinguished professor at John Hopkins University says that the data is pretty clear that surgical intervention on this doesn't help. So in other words, someone has the surgical intervention and they still feel disappointed, alienated. So in other words, you're dealing with something deeper, more spiritual, and then you come back to the gospel. Does that help? It's a tricky situation, but I would... Start from the position you did and then categorize and then go in slightly different directions depending on which category they're in. Okay. Sorry, my answers are long, but these are such big questions that each one is like a mini sermon, so I hope that's all right. There's a question right at the back there. I can't quite see who it is. There's a gentleman there. Thanks, Eric. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's remarkably hard to actually see people's faces from the front. You'll find out one day because of the, the lights. It's... Well, I, talk, I talked last week, and so if there was somebody else, I wanted to make sure that I didn't hog the microphone. So I think you're all right. We'll, we'll tell you okay. if you hog the microphone. Well, for, first of all, I wanted to say that, uh, and I'm, I'm not patronizing you on this, you had a marvelous sermon this morning. Oh, thank you. And, and uh, that sermon, if I understand correctly, might have been considered illegal in Canada. What I wanted to ask you was, yeah. if you were preaching in Canada, how would you deal with this? You know, I, I've been thinking about that. I was up in Canada this summer um, preaching at a Bible camp up there. Uh, it's a Bible conference center, a wonderful Bible conference center with a, a godly man there who, anyway, you don't want to know all about that, but it's, it's a good place, right? And he's doing a great job, and he's bringing in people to teach the Bible, and they're really being revived, I think. And so it's a great experience. And um, I got some of these questions there. 
afterwards. I, mean, I was just teaching the Bible, but these, it's a real issue for people in Canada, and I think you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, so the, to answer your question, would I say anything differently? I don't think so. I do think that as a pastor, our responsibility, obviously, as Jesus says, we need to be as innocent as doves and as canny as snakes. You know that phrase? In other words, we need to be, we're not always looking for a fight. You know, there are times when it's just wiser to, uh, Daniel and Joseph, they had to find many different ways to live within a pagan environment. And we need to be wise. But on issues like this, when the church itself is very confused, and not only very confused, the church therefore, the broader church, I don't mean college church, I don't think we are, but the broader church is very confused. On not only uh, therefore confused, but therefore misrepresenting what we really think, and therefore what we really think being misheard, which creates the very problems you're talking about because people think that we're homophobic or whatever. And that comes from a misunderstanding of what we're really saying, as well as a misappreciation of it too. You can't always persuade people. But I do think as a pastor, you have a responsibility to teach the whole counsel of God. And there's no doubt this is an area of confusion, and so we need to lean into it. Um, so I, I was just over across the street with the college students, and I, I said to them, in answer to a different kind of question, but related, that one of the things I was thinking was, it's possible that in 10 years' time, or maybe less, someone will be looking back through my record and they'll put up this sermon, you know, that could, that could get me into trouble, and maybe more recently. Um, you know, but we live as inheritors of polycarp. And, you know, if, if your pastor can't be brave enough to stand behind a pulpit where, frankly, most of the people are his friends, right, and speak about stuff and clarify things that, you know, people like you are going, thank goodness someone has clarified. If I can't be that bold, how can I possibly ask a business Christian leader to walk for Christ as salt and light in this world? I can't. So I have to teach on it. So I, ha I did think about those things, but... You know, wise, careful, loving, nuance, but you still teach the truth. Thank you. Oh, good, we can go home. There's a question. Oh, there's one back there, and then, I'm sorry, one, one here is afterwards. Yes. I'm uh, visiting from out of town, so I didn't hear your sermon this morning. Oh, okay. But um, do you believe that um, some of the new terminology of gay Christian and sexual minority, do you believe that's a legitimate biblical uh, distinction? Yeah. Well, I would say, I listened to the sermon this morning. Um, sorry, that's a little, we don't know each other. I'm not being nasty, I'm joking, right? Um, I, the reason why I would say that is it's, I have an easy answer to that, but it will seem simplistic if, if there isn't any grounding to it. So um, it's important to get into the, the overall structure of the Bible and the gospel and how that relates to this particular matter. Otherwise, if, if, if I just say, no, I don't, it just sounds like I'm dismissing the way people feel, right? And I'm, I'm not being fair to their identity and even perhaps um, being pastorally irresponsible because we all know there are people who seriously struggle with these issues and they can end up feeling terribly isolated and alone, do self-harm and all sorts of things. So it's very important that we get the infrastructure of the gospel and the Bible correct and clear in our mind as we give an answer to that. Uh, and namely, again, without repeating the whole sermon this morning, um, Paul's point is that the answer to that is the word of the cross, the death and the resurrection of Jesus in 1 Corinthians, that frames the book. Then in between the book you have his flee from sexual immorality and flee from idolatry. He's writing Romans from the same city that Corinth and in Romans he talks about sexual morality as a fruit of idolatry, probably has the same frame in his mind, though in Corinthians he's more practical, flee from sexual immorality, flee from idolatry. 
Then it comes to the sexual immorality thing. He has a series of do you not knows. So he's appealing to what they already know about the word of the cross. Don't you know? You should really know this, don't you know? And in particular, okay, so we get that clear. It comes out of the word of the cross. Well, then what does that mean? Well, then you walk through the word of the cross, the creation, fall, redemption, response. Creation, male and feel, female, is rooted in the, in the, isn't an accidental part of God's creation, but is um, heaven and earth, male and female, the wedding banquet at the end. This is not accidental. This is theological. This is even evangelistic uh, creation. Then you get to fall. I think part of the problem is, and I think churches across the land are at fault for this, we pastors have not preached sin. We have not articulated it. So people don't realize, or, or maybe they do and don't want to realize, but what I feel is right is not necessarily right. Why? Because I'm fallen. What I desire by nature is not necessarily the right thing. I told a story that, from N.T. Wright, who told this story about a man who'd been in an adulterous relationship soon after, had an affair, soon after he got married and was very confused about it. And N.T. Wright said, apparently this person never crossed his mind that most, well, not most perhaps, many men are by nature um, drawn to have sexual intimacy with more than one woman, polygamous. Uh, and so it felt right for him to have an affair. In fact, it felt the natural thing to do because in a sense it was, because he's fallen. Right? So then you have that, then you have redemption. Well, God, because of the word of the cross, Paul says, that was what some of you were, but now you've been washed, right, white, p- clean and pure. Now, n- now you sanctified. Now you have this power this in within you so you can be holy. Now you're justified. You're declared righteous before God and you have a clean start because of Christ. And so there's this word of cross. So, you know, um, uh, um, there's a way back to God from the dark path of sin. There's a door that is open and you may go in. That Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. That's true of us all. And I talked a little bit about the identity issues you're bringing up. The issue is for all of us, you know, Corinth had a lot of idols. We have a lot of idols. In particular, in our culture, we have the idol of self. I don't think it's by accident. I mean, there's been books and research on this. It's not by accident. The, most, the biggest company in the world with the most successful technology in the world is called iPhone, iMac. Um, it's me, myself, and I. And so we have this, we're identified by who I am, trying to discover myself. That's not the Christian goal at all. The Christian goal is to not be yourself, it's to be like Jesus. I quoted from John Calvin who said that the beginning of the Christian life, the Christian life starts when you, start, when you learn to forget yourself. So all that is a long, and then there's the response. So this is a Christian, we're talking about Christians here. The response there is, yes, there are Christians who struggle with same-sex attraction. Sam Albury, uh, who's written this little book, Anti, uh, Is God Anti-Gay, would be a good framework, I think, for this issue for you. Um, you get that online, it's sold hundreds of thousands, it's really good. Um, yes, and he's someone who struggles with same-sex attraction, but he lives a celibate lifestyle, and it's good, and he rejoices in it. And so what are the options then open for someone who's a Christian who struggles with this? Well, as Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 7, right after that passage, the options are either singleness, like Paul, and Jesus, or marriage between a man and a woman. It sounds very hard. But then we need to re- rediscover and reclaim this vision of, of, of the celibate lifestyle. Not that everyone who's single is in any way struggling with same-sex attraction, but but that that's a legitimate, and not a legitimate, a good calling, and is a place of blessing. And um, so, you know, that's a long way to say no, but I, I hope you understand that it's important we get the framework. Okay. There was a question right here. With a British accent, they sound much smarter. <laughs> well, um, you're kind. 
Uh, well, I have maybe two, and they sort of fit together. One grew out of your initial prayer. By the way, I loved your sermon this morning. Oh, thank you. Uh, you prayed about not being a, nothing to be said here that would be a stumbling block. Mm. So, but, you know, for those of us who engage in the world on these topics, everything is a stumbling block. Mm -hmm. If someone were to say directly, well, do you think homosexual activity is wrong? And you were to say, and you didn't have time to do as right. gracious and comprehensive right. a, as you did, and you were to say, yes, they, that is a stumbling block, or they will tell you it's a stumbling block. Mm -hmm. And then that gets to that sort of an addition. What I wanted to ask about, there was some years ago, Leon Podols had an article in Christianity Today, or Touchstone magazine, I think it was, about anger in the church. And his argument, which I think is valid, is that there are some things about which we should feel angry. Mm -hmm. Now, what we do with that, you know, obviously you can sin with that, and, and I was wondering what you think about that because, it, and I was glad you touched on the whole trans movement mm -hmm. because I feel like the church, when we're doing double mastectomies on 13 year old girls and chemically sterilizing 15 year olds, that we should feel angry about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I understand. So I was just wondering if you could address So, that. in other words, yeah. Um, stumbling block. So, I was using it in a kind of technical word way when I was praying earlier. So, um, you know, Jesus talks about that nothing, uh, offenses are bound to come, but you don't want to be the person who causes that stumbling block or offense. It's the same kind of, it's a scandal on, same root idea, an offense, a stamp, stumbling block. And uh, Paul talks about um, no stumbling block, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a stumbling block. You know, it's foolishness. Uh, to Greeks, and you know, and uh, and so th th there is a stumbling block to the gospel, um, but you want to keep it at the go level of the gospel and, and the Bible, rather than personality things, rather than opinion things. Now, when it comes to moral issues, it becomes somewhat, and that, in some ways, goes back to the same question about: Is this a Christian? Is this not a Christian? How do you? you so, if I'm having a personal relationship with someone, I would say, in to answer that question, oh, that's a great question, and. You know, we probably have different opinions on that, but you probably have a different opinion than I do about whether it's a good thing to follow Jesus. Uh, hey, let's make a deal. Um, I'll read all the stuff you want me to read on that with an open mind if you'll read the Bible with me. Would you do that? Something like, so in other words, you open the conversation rather than, you know, immediately, they know where you stand, but you're not immediately on the attack. That's the kind of thing I would do with someone like that at a personal level. Um, so does that help? Okay, yeah. And there's a question here. I'm not sure whether you're... I'm sorry, what was the last part? Tell me again. About, is there a place in the church oh, for anger? Yeah, yeah. Y yes, there is. But it's particular, and you almost quoted from it. it it's, it, you know, so the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. So, uh, so that means that anger is not always wrong. It also means that anger is dangerous. In your anger, do not sin. So and some of this goes back to your own temperament. There are just people who, you know, are angry. They get upset about stuff. And they're like a shotgun, you know. They're upset about a whole bunch of stuff. And every now and then, they're upset about the right thing, right? And for that person, you say, look, in your anger, do not sin. And, other, and there are other people who are pushovers. And you say, look, come on, this matters. How, how, you've got to stand up. So some of it comes down to pastoral and the individual person. And, but there are times when we, sh we, we should speak out against, well, we, the previous week, injustices. We should speak out against things that are wrong. And there's a whole heritage of prophetic literature in the Bible about this. Yes. But, but, but it's dangerous. And um, so that's why it's important in community. I want, you know, if I was feeling passionately angry about something, I almost wanted to speak out of that. I want to check with some of my brother pastors or elders and say, look, I'm really feeling we need to address this. And this is serious. And I want to make sure I wasn't just annoyed, you know? So there is a place for it. But it's almost like a dangerous virtue, righteous anger, a dangerous virtue. So there was a question back here I pointed to, and then there's, I think there's one down the front. Um, you just came from the college students, um, so I'd be interested to hear 
what you think they, how they are approaching the issue and what yeah. they're struggling with in that. Because we had a group of college students over uh, to the house and I asked a question about this. And one of the responses was, why is your generation so concerned about gender? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was just curious of what your feeling is of what the college students are dealing with. I, um, yeah, I, with a, a Ben Panner, Pastor Panner, is doing a great job. There's probably, I don't know, 100 or so college students over there, places packed, vibrant atmosphere, happy, and all the questions were friendly. They were so pleased that this matter is being addressed from the Bible. Now, one question did come up about someone saying, they have a friend who's a, who goes to a different church and their pastor just said this morning that, and I won't even repeat what it is because it was so, you know, you may, anyway, it was something that was not just insensitive to people in, in that group, the LGBTQ group, but, but it wasn't in your anger, do not sin, it was just anger, you know. And then, then using theology to sort of mask that anger, it's like, oh my goodness, don't say that. No wonder your friend's upset. But when we address it biblically from the Bible, from the framework of the gospel, it was just like, it felt like putty in your hands, like, oh, thank you so much. So I think part of the problem is people like me haven't taught on it enough. Because uh, it's hard to do, and you, you feel like you're going to get it in the neck, and I probably will, but you know, you've got it. And, but they were very soft to it, actually. So, there was a question down the front here. I don't know if John, you want to get that one? I, I wasn't going to do this, but because uh, I'm kind of embarrassed about thinking about this. <clears throat> I've, I've gotten the thought in reading uh, Genesis that um, it doesn't tell us that when God made a lion, he sat the lion down, put him to sleep, and took one of the lion's ribs, and then made the lioness. Mm -hmm. It seems like he made a male lion and a female lion. Mm -hmm. It's only the man yeah. that this, this uh, occurs. And, and I get the feeling when I read it that um, God put man and woman together to start, that we were one. Mm -hmm. And then when we get together as a man and a woman in marriage, we become one again. Mm -hmm. And I get, I get the, I mean, this is kind of maybe crazy. You can tell me I'm crazy. Uh, but I get the feeling that why did God really need Adam's rib. Mm -hmm. he, he could have made Eve the same way he made Adam, but he didn't. He yeah. took a rib because Adam had the essence of woman in him. This is what I'm thinking. Okay, there's a question here somewhere, right? Huh? There's a question here somewhere. Yeah. No, I'm, uh, here's the question. Okay. Do you think I'm crazy about this? No, no. <laughs> no wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I'm, John's I'm not trying done to get yet. the microphone. So, so uh, Adam, Adam has the essence of woman, and then God puts him to sleep, takes the rib, but takes the essence of woman out of him, mm -hmm. and that's what the Latin means, out of man. Right. He takes all of it. He didn't need the rib to make a woman, but he needed the essence of woman that was in man. That's, that's the kind of well, concept I get. Right. And anyway, I could go on, but I'm not going to do okay. it. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, uh, um, so, you know, where I think I can land with you is uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 1 that male and female are both made in the image of God. So though there is a distinction, we are both image bearers. Um, and there is a final goal of unity, of course, the, the bride of Christ. Um, but the whole, the, the idea of the kind of, sh um, and you're not saying this, but in our culture, the idea of kind of the shmash of everyone being a bit of something is, is quite different from creation. There's this constant division, you know, heaven and earth, this and that. This is always separating and ordering. And so that the, the final union is 
uh, not like a kind of schmash of grayness. It's like this beautiful orchestra where the, all these different parts, particularly male and female, now come together in a, in a, in a, in a union that is yeah, more orchestral than simply a monotone. You know? it's one, I think it's one of the reasons. I, um, shall I say this? No, maybe I won't say this. I, I was going to quote from Alistair Begg, but I, I won't do that. So, there's a question back there. All right. He's going to hold the mic. I'm not going to talk that long. Um, uh, my question has a bunch of different facets, so I'll try to be uh, succinct. The, it seems like uh, in the church, just historically, there have been certain sins that have been treated with more mm. uh, fervency than others through the ages. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's kind of a, yeah. uh, an, an observation um, I have there. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, the, uh, but also, I'm curious, maybe from your experience and from your research, are there things about sexual sin that are more impactful to our ability to commune with God or things like that that mean that this is a particular sin we should be focusing on more than something like, um, you know, if someone is struggling with gluttony and, and they're kind of back and forth in and out of it and, and we're helping them, obviously, or someone's struggling with how they express their anger or a lot of these other sins that... Um, have more gray areas in between right. versus the sexual sin being very black and white. If you could kind of expound yep. on why we focus so much on it, that would be helpful. Yep. So I think that's a great question. And um, so I've got like sort of two or three sort of different things about that. So the first is that, um, so what is sin? So sin is Rebellion against God, so it's relational. Um, but that rebellion is defined biblically through the law, which is why Paul talks about how the law kind of amplifies sin because it, it makes you realize you are rebelling against God, right? And so it's relational, rebellion against God, um, defined and amplified through the law. You know, you, if you have a piece of grass outside and you put up a sign saying, do not walk on the grass, likely as not, you'll get more people walking on the grass than if you didn't put up the sign. I mean, so it has that kind of impact sometimes. Um, so that's, so what is sin? Rebellion against God as expressed through the Ten Commandments, the law of God, that's what it means to not do what, what God requires of us. At its heart, it's putting us in place of God. So what we're saying is, I get to make the rules. I get to decide what's good for me. You, God, do not. Right? Then that, so in other words, we need to elevate what sin is. It's not just sins, it's sin. Right? Then that sin is then um, expressed in, in any number of different ways. Um, and Paul listed some of them this morning, that yeah, there was sexual immorality for sure in the text, but there was also reviling, gossip. I mean, I've been doing this series on Proverbs in the devotional thing I do each day, and the Proverbs is very clear about the damaging impact of gossip. Um, one place it says, throw out the gossiper and quarrels cease. You know, so if you're in a small group or you're in a community somewhere, there's a whole bunch of people kind of in friction with each other. Maybe there's someone who's gossiping and they need a word of correction. You're like, brother, have you got an issue? Say it to the person, don't, you know. Um, reviling has a real impact. Um, uh, so that leads to a kind of all sin is sin thing. Um, If you, yeah, um, the old, I guess Billy Graham did this a lot, but the, the old illustration of the, uh, of the canyon, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're on one side and you're on the other side, 
and if righteousness is here and your, your good works lead you this far, or they lead you this far, or we might turn it around and say, if your sins are this bad or this bad, but they're still, they're still bad, you, either way, you fall into the canyon, right? So, um, so all sin will lead you to hell, if not brought to the foot of the cross and redeemed and washed and sanctified and justified by the blood of Jesus Christ and through the spirit of our, of our God. Um, so again, that leads to a kind of unity view on, on sin. But having said that, and, and, and we should say, therefore, that the church sometimes has a, I like how uh, Vaughan Roberts put it in his book on transgender. He says that a church should not have uh, on this issue a yuck approach or a yes approach. So we have to be uh, frank with ourselves. There are some sins that our own personality or temperament just find more like yuck. And that can keep us distant from relationally from people who need our love. And that can be cultural. And, and, uh, and the church sometimes has done that, I think. It has responded to people who struggle with mm, pornography or homosexuality or something with a sort of yuck. When, you know, the person who's greedy, well, sometimes they can even be promoted because, you know, the church hopes they'll give them money. Um, so we do need a prophetic word in that regard to say, no, no all sin is sin. Having said that, there is no doubt that some sins have worst, worst ramifications. I mean, surely this is the case. I mean, take, take the most extreme example. Um, is the person in 1940s Germany who kind of goes along with Nazism, doesn't do what he should have done, and never speaks out, and does what he says, yes sir, in the wrong. Yeah, I think so. Is his sin as bad as Hitler? No, I don't think so. So some sins do have a worse impact. Some sins have a worse impact on yourself, which is what Paul was talking about here. It's sinning against the body. The sexual sin does have, um, because of the very nature of its intimacy, it does have a, a worse impact on yourself, on your body, than other sins. But not irredeemable. This is such with some of you. And sometimes, and I may be talking to people here tonight who struggle with some of these things. Sometimes God can use that very sin, when repented of, to become a place, a, a testimony in a church like this. You know, actually, I was there once, and then I got into God's Word, I looked at 1 Corinthians 6, I realized there was power in the gospel to change my life, and now I no longer am. And that becomes a glorious testimony. Yeah, still struggling, still in community about it, still fighting but following Jesus, and one day I'll be in a place where it's not possible for me to sin. So we need to, and again, I'm probably over-nuancing it, but I think it's important we do. Otherwise, we become, feels like we're kicking certain kinds of people, not other kinds of people, which is not good. We've probably got time for, what's the, what is the time? Maybe just a couple more, depending on how long I go. We've got one on the back and one down the front. Thank you. Anita White. Uh, I wonder if you could just comment on these verses. It's Matthew 19, yeah. right after Jesus talks about uh, divorce and adultery. And then he, I never noticed these verses much before. Um, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. 
let the one who is able to receive this receive it. Could you yeah. talk on that? Thank you. Thank you, Anita. That's actually one of those texts that was a sort of alternative possibility for a sermon like this. It's a very important text. Um, if quite difficult to understand. Um, but but uh, so in the in the passage, uh, Jesus has just defined marriage, and then he's he's elevated marriage to such an extent that the disciples say, "Well, if that's what marriage is, it's better better not to marry." <laughs> um, and then he says, "Well, this is you know for those who can receive it, this is." but there are people who are eunuchs. Some have been made that way, some by choice. And so what, what Jesus is talking to there is obviously this, you know, so you've got creation, fall, redemption, response, the, the area of the fall. So there, is, there are people who have different kinds of physical uh, struggles in this area, physical um, issues in this area. There are people who make choices in this area. So traditionally, that's interpreted as um, those who decide singleness, gift of singleness. I decide I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to cut off, as it were, that part of my life. But and then he and then that's why Paul talk, later talks about it being a gift. He says those who can receive it receive it, but not everyone has that gift. So it fits, fits pretty much with the same framework of of creation. Yeah, this is elevate. This is elevating the gift of marriage. Uh, fall, but there are these issues. But because of the redemptive power of Christ, there are people who choose the gift of singleness, and that, if that is you, is to be celebrated. Does, does that help? Anita, I think, is smiling at me. I'm not sure. That's okay. Okay, right. I passed. Good. I'm going to attempt one of those English accents. So I say I'm <laughs> very smart. <laughs> By definition, Christians are against pretty much everything. Um, and that may be justified um, in many senses, but it is the antidote to that that we need to re rediscover the character of God, who God is. So rather than get embroiled in, there'll, there'll always be something. Yeah. Um, should we be re rediscovering who God is and maybe starting from there a little more often. Yeah, I think that's a great observation. I think it's true. Absolutely. Yeah, we need to keep the character of God, the nature of the gospel. Um, uh, so we never want to be known as a church. What we want to be known for as a church is who Jesus is, who God is, what the message is. That's what we want to be known for. Um, and that's why this kind of sermon is not a regular sermon, because we don't want it to be our main diet. On the other hand, I do think there are times when we need to clarify what we think about these things. But we then, when we clarify, we need to clarify in such a way that puts the word of the cross back at the heart of it. But I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there will be something else in 10, 15 years. And we've got to be the people who have this, this message. So, and I think Tim Keller is brilliant on this. Uh, he says, in various ways, he says, what you want is to people to think I wish that were true. I wish that that was true. In other words, you articulate who God is and his love and the gospel in such a winsome way that someone's thinking, I wish that was true. And then they'll come along and find out it is true. And, and then again, that goes back to the clarification, is someone in a, a Christian or Because you want to first lead someone to Jesus and then when they discover Jesus, then figure out what, what the ramifications are for sexual, uh, money, um, the way you spend your time, your calling, all these different things. Not that they're all actually equal in their ramifications or effect, but they all are equally um, implications of the same gospel and the character of God. So I agree with you. I think that's absolutely right. That's a good way to finish. I think we should stop. What is the time? 7.01. Shall we have mercy on the children's workers? Yes. All right, um, I'll be around if you want to chat any more. I hope that's been encouraging. And we, as our brother reminds us, we want to stay focused on the gospel and the nature of God. So let me close with prayer, and then we'll move on. Thank you, Lord, so much. And we just want to bow before you and remember who you are, God of love, God of truth, 
holy God, beautiful beyond all comparison, the very source of life. Lord, as we go forward into this week ahead, would you keep us, would you remind us, would you assure us of this reality of who you are and help us then to live in the light of uh, the word of the cross. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory, amen.